we're going to take a look at banked curves. A banked curve is just an inclined plane that allows drivers, cyclists, and even runners to move more easily in a circular path. Here you can see an image of some cyclists riding on a banked curve. And this shows how engineers create banked roads to allow cars to turn more safely. Now, before we progress too far into banked curves, let's go back to remember the physics of a car turning on a level road. We know that because of inertia, an object in motion will stay in motion in a straight line with a constant velocity. So if you're just driving on a level road and want to turn, what do you need? A net force. And for uniform circular motion, there must be a net force toward the center of the circle. This is called the centripetal force. It's important to note that the centripetal force isn't some kind of new extra force. It's just the result of the forces we'd normally draw on our free body diagrams summed up in the radial direction. So when you're driving on a flat ground and make a turn, what is providing the force causing you to turn? One way you can think about this is to ask yourself, can you turn easily on an icy road? Well, not really. So that tells us that friction is the force that normally allows us to turn when we're talking about flat roads. However, on a banked curve, in addition to friction, the surface itself pushes the car, or in this case, the bicycles, toward the center of the circle. So now that we have that background, let's look at a problem. So let's say that you drive a car along a banked curve at a constant speed without slipping. The incline makes an angle of theta above the ground, and the curve has a radius of curvature r. We also know that the coefficients of static and kinetic friction between the car's rubber tires and the asphalt road are mu s and mu k, respectively. Our job is to figure out what is the maximum speed you can drive without the car slipping. So here's a picture of the car, and you can think about this car as traveling into the page, and it's going to be mapping out a little bit of a circular path. Now, what they mean by R is that the distance between the center of the circle and the center of mass of the car is R. Now, in order to solve this problem, we need to draw a free body diagram. So I'm going to draw this one really large because I'm going to be putting a lot of stuff on it. So I'm going to turn my car into a simplified point particle. And for a moment, let's consider what would happen if there were no friction. So other than friction, what forces are acting on the car as it goes around the bank? Well, we know the force of gravity, of course which is the mass of the car, which I'm going to call m, times the acceleration due to gravity, g. And we also know this surface is pushing perpendicularly on the car with a normal force of n. Now, this car is traveling around a circle, so which way is it accelerating? Well, it's accelerating towards the center of the circle, so the acceleration is to the left. To make our problem solving easier, we will also make this the direction of our positive x-axis. So whenever you can, make the direction of your acceleration also be the direction of one of your positive axes. So if this is positive x, then positive y will simply be pointing upwards perpendicular to positive x. Given this coordinate system, which of these forces do we need to break up into components? Well, we know mg is going in the direction of negative y, so that one looks good, but normal force has two components. One component going in the y direction, which I'll call ny, and one component going into the x direction, which I'm going to call nx. Along the y-axis, we can see that the normal force is balancing out the force of gravity, but here we see that nx is the only force acting in the x direction. We also see that nx is pointing towards the center of the circle. So this means that nx is the centripetal force. So even without friction, the car can make it around a circular path because the surface is actually pushing it inward. Now there's one catch. In this case where there's no friction, there's only one specific speed. We're going to call that the critical speed. where you can stay along that path. 
If you go too fast or too slow, you're going to slide up or slide down the slope. So let's kind of dig into that. So let's say that this is the critical speed. This is the speed at which you can stay in a circular motion even without friction. But what happens if you start going faster than this critical speed? So if you start going too fast, you're naturally gonna wanna start sliding up the ramp because there's not gonna be enough force that's pulling you into the center of the circle and your inertia is just gonna cause you to slide up the ramp. So if you go too fast, you're gonna naturally wanna slide up the ramp. So friction is actually gonna be trying to pull you back down the ramp. Likewise, if you start going too slow, Basically, if you're going too slowly, you're going to start to want to slide down the ramp. So in that case, friction is going to be trying to pull you up the ramp. Because of this, friction widens your ability to move at different speeds and still remain on that circular path. So I think it's pretty neat that friction can change directions depending on how fast you're moving. And this is one of the things I love about solving physics problems. You really have to think about what's going on. You can't just do this from rote memory. What kind of friction is this? Static friction or kinetic friction? Well, the car is moving, so you might be tempted to think kinetic friction, but it's not kinetic friction, it's static friction. So why would it be static friction? Even though the car is moving, the asphalt and the rubber on the tire are not moving with respect to one another. Think about the point of contact between the rubber and the asphalt. The rubber isn't sliding on the asphalt, the rubber grabs the asphalt, then as the wheel turns, another point on the tire grabs the asphalt. At each point of contact, the tire and the road are stationary with respect to one another. Now that we have all that set up, let's actually find the max speed the car can travel without sliding up the ramp. We know that you'll be moving faster than the critical speed, which means that without friction, you would normally be sliding up the ramp, so friction must be pointing down the ramp. And now we know that's static friction. Static friction doesn't match our coordinate systems, so now we have to break static friction into its components. So we can see that we have one component going in the x direction and one component going in the negative y direction. Okay, so before we can go any further, we actually have to figure out all of these angles. So what I'm gonna do is actually get rid of this text and this diagram and blow up this free body diagram. Now that this image is blown up, we can go ahead and try to figure out where all the angles go. So if this is angle theta, I hope you can see that this is also angle theta because this line is parallel to that line. And this angle is 90 degrees. So that makes this angle 90 minus theta. And you can see that this angle is also 90 degrees. And since this is 90 minus theta, this has to be theta. This angle is theta and this angle is theta. This made our diagram really confusing, so I'm gonna take away these extra notes, but now you know where this angle theta came from and this angle theta came from. Now that we have these angles written down, we can solve for the component vectors. So here, ny is the adjacent side to this angle theta. So ny is just the normal force times cosine theta and nx would be the normal force times sine theta. Here, since this is the friction static and here's the angle, this side would be the adjacent side. So this would be fs cosine theta and this would be fs sine theta. Now that I have a really detailed free body diagram, Going through and doing the analysis of Newton's second law is actually pretty straightforward. So what we want to do is say the sum of the forces in the x direction equals ma in the x direction, and the sum of the forces in the y direction equals ma in the y direction. So in the x direction, we have 
this cosine theta component of the static friction plus this n sine theta component of the normal force. So those are both going in the positive direction. So we can say this is Fs cosine theta plus n sine theta equals the mass of the car times the acceleration in the x direction. So in the x direction, what's the acceleration? Well, we know it's going in a circle, and that's pointing towards the center of the circle. So ax is just going to be our centripetal acceleration, which is v squared over r. In the y direction, you have n cosine theta going in the positive y direction, mg and f sine theta going in the negative y direction. So that leaves us with n cosine theta minus mg minus the static friction force times sine theta. equals the mass of the car times the acceleration in the y direction. Now, since this car isn't accelerating out of the ramp or into the ramp, we know that its acceleration in the y direction is zero. Now, for this problem, we want to find the maximum speed we can do without sliding up the ramp. So we really want friction to give us the maximum possible force. So because of that, we can use our equation that the static friction max is mu s times the normal force. So I can plug that in for all the static frictions. So this becomes mu s times the normal force times cosine theta plus n sine theta equals mv squared over r. And this becomes n cosine theta minus mg minus mu s times the normal force times sine theta equals zero. Now at this point, the only thing left to do is algebra. So before we do that, let's go ahead and look at the physics just to recap what we saw. Basically, when you have this banked curve, you have only a few forces acting on it. The force of gravity pulling it downward and the normal force pushing perpendicular. Now, this normal force is enough to allow the car to go in a circular path at a very specific velocity. However, if you go a little bit faster, then the car would want to slide up if there wasn't friction. So friction is going to be pulling down the ramp. On the other hand, if you were going slower than the critical velocity and there were no friction, you would have a tendency to slide down the ramp. So friction would then be acting up the ramp. Now in this case, we wanted to go fast, and so that's why we had friction pointing down the ramp. Now our goal was to find the maximum speed such that we could stay on this path without slipping. If you wanna go and find that on your own and then fast forward to the end to see if we got the same result, that's great. If you'd like to stick around and watch how to manipulate these equations, that's fine too. So what I'm gonna do next is pull out the normal force on this equation, and I'll have normal force equals mu s cosine theta plus sine theta equals mv squared over r. And I'll do a similar thing over here, but first I need to add mg to both sides. So I'll say n cosine theta minus mu s n sine theta equals mg. Now I can pull out a normal force and I have cosine theta minus mu s sine theta equals mg. And so here I see that my normal force is equal to mg over cosine theta minus mu s sine theta. I can then take this and plug it in here. So my normal force becomes mg over cosine theta minus mu s sine theta times the same stuff that I had up on top earlier. So I'll just put these in parentheses just so you know all that's together. So this is mu s cosine theta plus sine theta 
and that still equals mv squared over r. Now you can see that the masses cancel out, which is kind of interesting. That means the maximum speed that you could travel would be the same for a little car as it would be for the Mack truck. And it's also good that this canceled out because I didn't give you the mass in the problem. And so whenever you answer a problem with variables, you can only use the variables that were given to you and constants. We want to solve for this velocity, so I can just multiply by r and then take the square root. So you end up with vmax being the square root of gr times mu s cosine theta plus sine theta divided by cosine theta minus mu s sine theta. So that was a pretty long problem, but I think it showed you a lot of interesting things that can happen with these banked curves, and it's a great review both for circular motion and just for Newton's laws.